Okay, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back to track two, Becoming a Stronger Advocate for our final breakout of the event. We all hope that you had a great break and have joined, enjoyed these last couple of days at the Global Gene Summit. I'm Angie Rowe, and I will be your host for today's session on the new normal, Patient Communities Drive Innovation. This track is being live streamed, and I would like to welcome our remote attendees and remind everyone that you can use our live Q&A feature on our app. Today, patients and advocates are a larger initiating force in change and impact. Whether it's reshaping programs or driving research, advocates have a bigger role to play in their own disease community. Today with us to share their expertise and knowledge is Kevin Chandler, founder of We Carry Kevin, Luke Rosen, founder of K. IF1.org, Deborah Rekesens, Program Director at Coriel Institute for Medical Research, and PJ Brooks, Program Director at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Welcome. Who each other? Cool. So I just start. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. I'm Kevin, and uh, yeah, a couple years ago, um, my friends and I went to Europe, and we left my wheelchair home, and uh, they carried me around in a backpack for three weeks. So that's why I'm here. Uh -huh. You go from being a backpack to getting to be on stage. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the, the key to that uh, for us was that um, we wanted to travel together as a group of friends and we wanted to uh, experience the world um, in a bigger way. We wanted to, to see everything and do everything and realize that uh, my wheelchair wasn't going to allow that. Uh, while it's a, a great tool um, that we're really thankful for, um, it does have its limits. Um, and so we had to think outside the box and um, came up with a, a creative solution for us. And uh, I've been able to share that with others since then, and so uh, it's been great ever since to uh, connect with other families, and uh, sometimes our idea works for them, and sometimes we get to come alongside them and, and work on other ideas. Um, but ultimately, uh, celebrating the idea that um, uh, accessibility comes, uh, comes fully to fruition with uh, community and working together and and getting creative uh, as a group, because um, we really can't do it on our own. Uh, I know I can't. I don't know about you, but um, but I love working with my friends uh, to come up with different ways of doing things, and uh, through that, getting to experience uh, the world and experience life together uh, to a fuller extent. And uh, through that, we get to grow as humans and uh, and as community. So. Um, just excited to be here and uh, talk about this with you guys and with this group, and uh, I'll pass it off to you. Wow. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm uh, uh, Luke Rosen, and I uh, am the founder of uh, KIF1A.org. Um, and I just wanted to—I wanted to start by uh, reading three things. So I. Um, tweeted to our to the whole community, but to our our KF1A community and other communities, but um, I, I said that all of our kids and all of our families will be right here next to me because I'm really just talking about what so many of us have done together. And then I said, um, you know, does anyone have any messages you want me to relay? Uh, so I have three of them <coughs> that I wanted to read. So um, the first one is uh, from uh, our amazing uh, team at, at, at Columbia. Um, and this is from Leah. Uh, Rare disease patients and families, this is about you. As researchers, we learn from you every day. We know you are the ones climbing the mountain day in and day out, and it's our privilege to travel with you on that journey and to help however we can. And that's from Leah. And here's one from um, Dominique, who's a researcher at the University of Vermont. And she wrote, um, to the KF1A, rare disease community, I see you, I value you, I care about you. I do not take your trust for granted. Your relentless vigor and your urgency play a huge part in driving rare disease research. 
forward. More than you may know, your voices are impactful, moving, and heard. And then a third one is from our fearless foundation president, Kat, um, and her message is remarkable. It's, we are a united global community of parents, caregivers, patients, scientists, clinicians, uh, who collaborate as equal partners and take action together to improve lives and find KF1A treatment. No one stakeholder group or individual can do it alone. We all have value to bring. So um, some messages that came in from uh, other really, really important people. Um, so I did put together just a couple of um, slides, and it's, uh, yeah, I um, wanted to start with my why, why this all kind of came about for us, and it's um, my daughter, Susanna. Um, and uh, there's Susanna uh, and her brother, Nat. Um, and um, she was diagnosed with a really rare uh, mutation in her, her KIF1A gene when she was two years old. And uh, two years ago, I couldn't make it to the Global Gene Summit. And Global Gene is such a huge part of me kind of understanding and, and trying to understand how to, how to do this in whatever capacity we could. And so uh, Susanna was in the hospital, and so we, I couldn't come. And when we got to the hospital, there was, if you can see that picture of my wife Sally and, my, and Susanna in the bed there, there was a box that Kendall and Nicole uh, had sent to the hospital. It was all Global Genes gear, like bracelets and hats. And so, uh, you know, the, everybody on the floor. And, and so we felt, and I think a lot of people um, feel that they are here with us, even if they're not, because they can't be. Um, but this is Susanna, and, and uh, Susanna is, is what got, got us into this. And when Susanna was diagnosed, um, we heard that there were 25 other people in the world who had this condition. And so we, you know, and that there was no treatment or no cure, and we weren't sure what the future would bring, but... Um, and then we thought, well, well, that can't be true. What do we need to do? And the answer was to find more people. And we had a, um, we, we got in touch with uh, as many of the families that we knew of that we could, and they all came to New York, to Columbia. And so there were, I think, um, seven families that came, and then a couple of more that had, had called in, and our incredible, you know, um, uh, Wendy Chung, who leads our, research uh, program and is, is Susanna's doctor and she calls herself our Sherpa. Um, uh, and her team hosted our families at Columbia. And that was in 2017, so right when the foundation started. And just um, last month, we had our first big family and scientific conference. And that's the picture on the other side. So we found now we have a strong growing community of over 200 families. Um, and researchers and clinicians from, uh, you know, places all over the world um, helping us on our mission and trying to, under trying to understand um, and trying to guide us and how we can get closer to the clinic with, with um, harness the science that already exists, really, right? And um, so this is, uh, these are two pictures that just, every time I look at them, I realize that there's so much potential out there if we can just mobilize as a community and activate and um, and yeah that's that's our family and our community and and so I'm just kind of showing some of the slides from the conference because uh, that's the message that we all pulled together together uh, our, our families together in our community and I I started thinking that you know our families and the foundations are the and in R and D right so it's kind of like it's our job to do everything we can to accelerate and to really be translational and make sure that it's coming from, you know, the, the research ends of things that, it, that is actually really pushing forward with, with urgency and with attention and, and in, without delay. And so the families play such a huge part in, in the development process of, of therapeutics, I think. And um, it's about, you know, understanding what matters most to the families and um, how, we can, how we can address that in research and development and, and 
we can't expect urgency if we don't respond with urgency. So um, I think it is really about making that one fluid process. And, and so we were lucky in our, um, in our, at our conference we had, I feel like the rare disease community is far more than our, our caregivers and our families. It's the scientific community coming together and it's, it's important to have everybody there. Um, and so it was a really remarkable. Uh, and and um, what is the most difficult part for many of our diseases is, um, is when knowing that things get worse and that um, we, we don't have all the time in the world to strategize about how we're going to go about doing things. It's, you know, we're, so many of our communities are just constantly relying on the fact that there are other scientists and people out there and, and you know, biotechs and people who are just taking shots on goal and hoping that this work is, is happening. And that's never more true for, um, you know, every once in a while, everyone in our community gets a reminder. And a reminder, you know, this is an example of a reminder that came to us just a couple of months ago is, um, you know, uh, recognizing that there's some um, atrophy in the brain that's happening. And, and while it's, you know, we, we know that that's to come, it's, it's pretty, um, it's a punch in the gut when it comes, even though you know it's, it's coming. So that's, that's what kind of makes our urgency real is, is the reality of the disease, like so many of us in here. So that's why we work so fast. And, and I, you know, I used to, I used to play hockey um, growing up and, and afterwards. And, you know, I don't know if any of you in here know about the, the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team. We call it the, the miracle on ice, right? Because 1980, so much was going on in the world. And, and these college kids that were on the, the U.S. Olympic team played the Russians, who were these finely tuned athletes, who were these, you know, incredible people. And, and USA won, and it was incredible. And there was that, and the announcer you know, said, do you believe in miracles? And um, all of these, these kids beat Russia. But, but what people forget is that that wasn't the gold medal game. Two days later, the U.S. hockey team had to come and beat Finland to win the gold medal. And imagine if we didn't beat Finland, right? Would it still be a miracle? So, you know, at the end of the conference, we thought, while it's amazing that we're all here doing this, right, we can't forget about Finland and just wait until the next time the communities get together. It's what we do tomorrow, and what are we going to do with all of this incredible information that we're getting and these, these collaborations that are being born we can't just wait another couple of months for them to happen. We need to, you know, tomorrow and the day after, put it into fifth gear because, you know, there are things happening that we're losing and we don't have time. So we can't forget about Finland. It's great that we're all doing this and it's what's going to happen next that's going to make the, make the difference, you know. Um, and then I, I want to play this. Can it, it, is, is there a way to, is there a way to play this video? Did you guys all see the We Talk Over? Imagine a world where scientists and doctors were lifted up to the same level as professional athletes. Where we celebrated treatments and cures the way we celebrate trophies and championships. We are the athletes using the power of sport to build up the researchers using the power of science to lift up the patients who need us more than ever. That's the world we're building. Isn't that incredible? It's, it's, and so the guys from Uplifting Athletes and, and um, you know, Simon and Candace who, who filmed this, it's, it's amazing. And it's, it is that, it's that example of, you know, the, the correlation of, you know, ath it's a relentless work ethic by everybody, right? And I think that this is pretty incredible. So it's hashtag we tackle rare. And um, yeah, I think it's a great, you know, trying to explain what I've rambled on about for 25 minutes in... 30 seconds, so I should have just played that, but thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> Thank you. It's well, just you. a pleasure to be here, especially up here with these guys. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, it is my pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I am Deborah Rekesens. I am the PI of the NIGMS repository at the Coriel Institute, and I'm here today to talk about biobanking and how 
the patient community can be a part of research by participating in a biobank. But before I start into biobank, I wanted to, because unlike uh, many of you here, my, my relationship to your community comes from a different place. And a few years ago, I was at a scientific conference. And during a particular complicated talk, the person next to me, the lady said, I hate it when they do this to us. Like, I'm not a scientist, and I don't understand anything. So it happened that I knew what they were talking about at that time. So I explained to her. I kind of translated nerd to, to English. And she was very excited about it. And she turned around. She's like, you're coming to Global Genes next year. I'm like, OK. And, uh, and this is how I met the wonderful oh. Carrie Austria. <laughs> um, and she did. She brought me that, that, that fall. And, and I gave them my first talk here to you guys. And, but the reason why she invited me wasn't because I was good at translated, translating science. It's because um, the cell lines and DNA of her lovely Miss Hannah live in my building. They participate in research year after year. She's still doing that from within the tanks in my building. So um, Carrie wanted people to know that it, that existed, that that was a resource that was available. And she wanted me to tell you guys about this. So this is a tweet that she posted recently based on a, a, a blog that we wrote about her. We interviewed her. And uh, she just wrote this for us um, very recently. So what is a biobank, right? So it's a collection of biological materials and all the data associated with this uh, material and that uh, this material has been set aside for research. We consider three particular things to be important for a biobank. They need to be stored properly. And you see here some of the tanks in my building, uh, liquid or vapor, vapor and nitrogen. We decided that they have to be high quality and well characterized. In our case, we have cell lines and DNA. Other banks also have tissues and other types of uh, biospecimens. And more importantly for us, they need to be easily and affordably distributed to scientists. That is very important. And I think this morning we heard uh, that you know, biobanks are to share. We like to say that we don't store specimens. We distribute them more than store them. Um, the NIGMS repository, which is the one that I manage, uh, is an NIH repository that has been at the Institute since 1972, since it was created. We have thousands of samples for over a 1,000 diseases. Uh, we focus on rare diseases and chromosomal abnormalities. And we do sell, send our samples to over 80 countries around the world. Uh, so people ask me, so what happens after your sample is established and set up in your banks? And I said, it, it leaves. We don't, we don't keep them. We don't want to keep them. We keep a little bit of it, but we don't want to keep them. We want to send them out. And that's what we do. We send them to all over the world for scientists everywhere to have access to these samples and be able to do research on these samples. Um, these samples are used for basic research, uh, disease research. We identify new genes. We explore the function of these genes. We want them to use the DNA and develop new genetic testing. We want them to make stem cells. We want them to finally find new treatments and cures uh, for these diseases. Um, so I want, I'm just going to tell you a few things about the collaborations and the type of things that we do with the, the rare disease community. Uh, this particular picture, I love it. It was from a, a conference a couple of years ago, and they had a wall where the kids had these flowers. And I, I love it that they are thanking us, and I just feel like, no, thank you. <laughs> so but they, it's a very, it's, it's, I love these this little flowers that they put together. But um, I want to start with what we call large collections. And this picture is from actually the CureCMD uh, conference a couple of years ago. We have been collaborating with the CureCMD, CMDs, the congenital um, muscular disorders. And uh, we've been growing with them so much. This is a type of collaboration that we can do with groups, uh, where we have over 200 cell lines. They represent almost 20 congenital muscle diseases. And also, we are linked to their international register data. So we are able to work with them directly. When they get new patients, they come to us, and vice versa. So it's a, it's a great way to grow a large collection from a specific group. Um, a lot of the collaborations come out with expected results. And this is really what you expect when you give your sample, right? You want things to happen the way you want. And this is a great example. And I love to talk about this one. This is actually pretty recent. The Corodoremia Research Foundation um, donated some samples, many samples. We'll be working with them for a couple of years now at that point, and we established a few cell lines from them. Uh, they were purchased and, and distributed to make stem cells and retinal cells. And uh, for the molecular therapeutics have been working with them and with us. And only last year, they already got uh, orphan drug designation for a gene therapy for the disease. So this is, this is what we're looking for. You give me your cell lines, and somebody will find your cure. So this is the expected result that we really want. 
we also get some unexpected results. And, uh, and in, for these cases, the, uh, the NPC, Bola Link, and I love talking about this one because it's incredible to me that this happened. But we've been working for the uh, NPC for a while, and they are very uh, vocal, they're big advocates of, of donating to us. So that they, they take these pictures where they take the little skin tissue from their arms before they send it to us, and they call for the people. So they did, they donated a lot of samples, we made a lot of cell lines for them, and they did a lot of research. Um, and yes, some people were working on developing treatments for NPC, but then a particular researcher realized that one of their cell lines uh, that was an NPC-affected cell line couldn't get infected with the Ebola virus. So it turns out that when a cell line has a knockout of the NPC, it actually is resistant to Ebola and many other actually similar viruses. So this was a great discovery. And so the, the drugs that don't work well on NPC work great on Ebola and vice versa. So this is one of those things like when I tell people, oh, I don't know if I want people that are not working on my research to, my, to get my cells. This is a chance. Sometimes it's a very completely unexpected thing and, and these things happen. Um, we work a lot with uh, outreach in social, in social media and I'm gonna give you two examples. Uh, we've been working recently with the Association for Creating Deficiencies and we put this blog for them. Um, in a month, we went from one patient donating to us to three new families in the US, one in Germany and one in Australia and a transfer of cell lines from established lab, only in a month. Uh, this is very little to read, but if you are interested in reading, you should go to their website, they have a good website. <laughs> um, so this is, this is how powerful social media and websites can be. All these people from all over the world have already contacted us and one and are ready to donate to us. We've also been working with Jeff at the Champ One Research Foundation. And we put this uh, little infogram for them. Uh, recently, they put them on their website and it has been a great success. We've been working with them at their family conference in, uh, this past month. And uh, actually this brings me to my next point, which is the blood collections. We are able to set up blood collections at the family meeting. So with the CHAMP one, we weren't able to go. There was a confusion on the location. It was too late to go. And they were able to set up a collection by themselves. They found a phlebotomist. We sent the kids. We organized everything remotely. And we came back with over 39 samples. So 39 people were able to donate to the repository through this conference. We also, we usually go. So here's an example of QCMD. Turner syndrome, GLUT1 this past month. Um, we were able to bring our own kids. We bring a phlebotomist. We organize the whole thing. Somebody gives a talk. We bring paperwork. We bring materials for the, for the attendants. And we are able that way to help out the community and not have every person go and donate, but they can do it in the same place. So this is just a way to show that the, the, the community that, that you're in and, and we are, I'm proud to be part of uh, can do this together. So we're here to help out in whatever way uh, we can. Uh, okay, that's it. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, well, thank you to the organizers. I'm also very happy to be here. Uh, PJ Brooks from the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And what I'm gonna do is tell you about some programs and platforms that we have at NCATS to facilitate and help out this, the new normal, these patient communities that are driving innovation, as you've heard here. Um, so this is my standard required federal government um, disclosure statement. Hope you've all gotten that. And so NCATS is uh, the newest part of the NIH. We're about seven years old now. And we're a bit different than the other, many of the other institutes and centers at NIH that many of them focus on like a specific organ system like the nervous system or uh, heart, lung, and blood, for example, or a specific type of disease like mental health or cancer. Uh, we, we actually don't have a specific focus like that. Our focus is basically on the whole process of translation. How do we make it better, faster, and more efficient? And you can see our mission statement, which is to catalyze the generation of innovative methods and technologies that will enhance basically translation across, across a wide range of human diseases and conditions. And that notably includes rare diseases. And in fact, I'm in the Office of Rare Diseases Research, which is the only Office of Rare Diseases Research at, at NIH, and we're part of NCATS. Um, but if this mission is a bit of a mouthful, an easier way to think of it is that we're all about finding ways to bring more treatments to more patients more quickly. And that cuts across any, any type of disease. And so we've got a variety of programs and initiatives in ORDR. Um, 
certainly in this time, I don't have a chance to talk about all of them, um, but you can see them here. And of course, I'd be happy to talk to you later in the meeting or follow up if people have any interest in those. But uh, today, I'll just kind of highlight a couple, the Rare Diseases Registry Pro Program, a toolkit for drug development, and a new project called PAVE GT. And so the toolkit, uh, as indicated here for patient-focused therapy development, is very much focused on essentially what it sounds like, developing a toolkit for people trying to develop therapies and treatments for rare diseases. And part of the motivation for this came from the experience we've had at ORDR, where quite often we'll have new patient groups coming into us and talking to us and saying, you know, we're, we're a new patient group, would like to develop a treatment for a disease. How do we go about it? What do we do? And we're happy to answer those questions and listen to the, you know, the science. But we found we keep answering the same questions over and over. And wouldn't it be more efficient to sort of make a public resource for everybody to look at? And that's basically what we did here with the toolkit. Um, and importantly, in doing this, uh, a lot of what we did, I'll go back one, is that we enlisted a lot of patient advocacy groups that had already gone through this process and done it successfully. And we worked with some of those, including uh, some people you may know, including Ron Bartek from Friedrichs Ataxia, uh, to sort of get all their experiences, all their best practices, and help us design this toolkit so that we could get you know, the best knowledge that was available. And so you can see this is a screenshot from the, our, our toolkit. You can see the different parts of the, the research and development process from discovery to preparing to clinical trials, FDA clinical trials, and, and FDA review, and after FDA approval. And if you click on any one of these, that'll open up another page, and you can see the different um, topics that you can find out about there. And if you click on those, that'll open another one. So there's actually quite a lot of information here that we hope will be valuable to, to, to groups, that, particularly those that are very starting out early, but anywhere along the whole process of, of translation for a specific disease. And I've got the website there, so you can, you can take a look at it. Um, but one of those things that we've, we've highlighted are, are patient registries. And in fact, that leads to another program to briefly highlight, which is what we call the RADAR program, the Rare Diseases Registry Program. This is a, an update from an earlier effort we had called the GRDR uh, program. But RADAR is really focused on helping people design their own registries. And again, to try to make available to the entire public never, who wants it information about how to get started setting up and managing your registry, a patient registry. And of course, there are really different, three different kinds of patient registries. Um, the simplest is a, what we call a contact registry. This can literally be an Excel spreadsheet of people's names, addresses, and phone numbers, or whatever, that you can keep. And that can actually be valuable, even in and of itself, when people are going to, if people are going to think about doing clinical trials. If you want to capture and have a patient registry that includes information about patient experience, um, that's a, a different kind of registry. There's patient reported health and medical information. And many of these are, in fact, operated by patient advocacy groups. There are sort of higher level requirements for uh, these kind of registries. And often they will require an institutional re review board or IRB approval. Um, and then finally, there are clinical registries uh, that have even higher requirements that contain clinical outcomes and, again, often created by patient advocacy groups and the requirements are stricter. And thinking through these different requirements, understanding them, we think, is, is very important as you go through this process in developing your registry. And here, again, is a, a screenshot of the registry platform. And if you open up, this is the way that showing you how you can create a registry plan. And I should have said, if the case is not clear, that one of the big things that registries are used for is, is in the context of clinical trials for um, recruiting patients and also carrying out and following up throughout the clinical trials. So it's clearly an, an important topic and we have the, the website here that is also a, a work in progress and you can see the, the website link. Um, I should also say finally too that this, this, our program, we do not actually create registries for anybody. This is advice and helping you to understand how to create registries. There are a variety of different vendors out there that you can go to, and we, don't, we can't recommend any of those, but this is the information to help you understand the pros and cons of the different registry options. Okay, so there's kind of a step back a little bit. This is something that we think about at ORDR all the time. 
And it's probably no news to you, but this is the rapidly increasing number of human conditions with a known molecular basis. And you can see from the 1990s to now, this was in 2016, we've gone up a lot. 6,000 rare diseases and counting, um, because this is kind of an old slide. And this is likely to continue with the, the increasing use of whole genome sequencing. The bad news, the depressing news, is that little brown box, little red box down there, which is that we've only got about 500 of these diseases with an approved therapy. As my boss, Chris Austin, likes to say, at this rate, it's going to take us a few thousand years to get a treatment for every disease. And that is just too darn long. And so as we think about it, we need changes to the process, not just sort of incremental changes, but pretty fundamental order of magnitude changes to get through this. And so one of the problems that we think about this, that really is a, is a bit of an issue and takes a bit of thinking differently is the idea of thinking about all these diseases individually. We much prefer to think of it rather than one disease at a time. What can we do for many diseases at a time? How can we lump these things together in ways that get translation to go faster? And we have some sort of thoughts about that. And this is a new one that we're just embarking on, so I don't have a lot of all the details yet. Uh, perhaps next year I'll have, certainly hope to have more. It's called uh, PAVE-GT, Platform Vector Gene Therapy Trials. And this is a collaboration between different parts of NCATS and two of our colleagues, uh, sister institutes at Genome and NINDS. And the basic idea is, I think, pretty simple. Um, the basic approach to gene therapy now is one disease at a time. And that was the way that was done for many, many years. But it's really a problematic now because that can result, particularly in gene therapy, in slow, inefficient uh, drug development, duplication of efforts across programs, and waste of money, waste of time, and waste of, of animals. And it's particularly hard because in many cases, the people who fund this research are patient advocates who've worked very hard to raise this money. Um, so we need to do it a different way. And so for many monogenes, genetic diseases, it, in principle, they could be treated by gene therapy. And it, what are called AEV vectors, adeno-associated virus vectors, are really just ways to deliver therapeutic genes into different cell types. And so far, they have an excellent safety record. We've seen clinical successes to approve drugs and a lot of preclinical success, a lot of really nice animal data, curing a lot of animal models, a lot of mice in the lab. Why is not more of it getting into the clinic? And again, I think the AEV vector and gene therapy in general is really a platform, and you could just use the same vector, swap out a different gene, and take advantage of the inherent platform capacity of this, this technology. And so the PAVE GT, we're actually going to try to do that. We're going to take, um, and we're also going to try to do it in a public way. So we're going to take four different, four rare genetic diseases none of which have any ongoing clinical uh, commercial interest because they're all so rare. We're going to use the same viral vector, the same root administration, the same production and purification methods, which is really important in gene therapy because, as people say, the process is a product, and just change the, the, uh, the therapeutic gene. And to try to go forward while these four at a time as a platform to see how that works and see if we can make the process more efficient. But a key thing I think that is worth emphasizing is as we do this, we're going to make all of the data, including all of our communications with the FDA and their communications back to us, we're going to make that public, <clears throat> publicly available so people can see how this is going to go. And we think this is important, particularly because for some of these diseases that are very, very rare and there's no commercial interest, the, the parents and, and patient advocates are going to be doing this themselves. And we're trying to pave a way to make it easier, faster, cheaper, et cetera. Um, through the PAVE GT project. And so as I said, it's a pretty early stage. We, we do have funding for it, which is good. We're starting to move and uh, we'll definitely be letting people know as soon as we get the data to make things available. And just kind of quickly, because I don't want to take too much time, but when you think about rare diseases, there, there are thousands, as I said, but really when you think about it, there's a lot smaller number of underlying causes, underlying etiologies. And some of them are listed here. I don't want to get too far into the science because it will throw people off. But the point is that, that there are a relatively small number of underlying etiologies, and many of them can be targeted with drugs. Um, and a lot of them also, there are underlying biochemical signaling pathways that cut across diseases. And if any of you heard um, the talk this morning on Castleman's disease, uh, David Fagenbaum was talking about how they used mTOR inhibitors in that disease. 
And basically, Castleman disease is one of a collection of what you might call mTORopathies. And it would make a lot more sense, instead of doing treatment with that specific drug, one disease at a time, to think about a clinical trial of mTORopathies cutting across different diseases. And that would be a lot more efficient. And in fact, that is the way that oncology drug development is going these days. They don't develop drugs anymore to treat spe like a specific, like liver cancer and breast cancer. I think the most exciting work is to focus on molecular targets that cut across all those different kind of cancers and do them all in a single clinical trial. And that should be possible on rare diseases as well. And just a, a kind of example of that, which is a story that some of you may have heard. This is a story of a little girl named uh, Mila who, had, who has Batten disease, a, a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And her disease was progressing. The family was moving toward gene therapy. It was going awfully slowly and, well, appropriately slowly because gene therapy takes a time. But what happened was a, an investigator, Tim Yu at Boston Children's, identified a second mutation in Mila through whole genome sequencing. And that particular mutation caused a, an abnormal splicing process that could be potentially targeted with an with a oligonucleotide, a, a small piece of DNA, somewhat like Spinraza, that's used for, for SMA. And with that information, they went from diagnosing that, that mutation to a clinical trial of this, of this oligonucleotide called Melicin for this one little girl within a little less than a year. And that's kind of a remarkable pathway. And you can kind of see that. And it's basically taking advantage of the, of the chemistry of the making DNA and therapeutic DNA that have been used in Spinraza. So now if you've been paying attention, and I hope you've been paying attention, right? It's, you might be thinking, hey, wait a second. You, you made this whole story about we should do all these diseases at once. Now you're talking about one person at a time. What is, what's the deal there? But in fact, the, the, the kind of mutation that she has and the basic approach of making a small piece of DNA to interfere with this abnormal splicing, that could be applied to rare diseases with the same kind of mutations across hundreds of them. And so far, ataxia telangiectasia is moving forward with this, and they've talked about it publicly. We've had a lot of other disease families come and talk about us in private. And this seems like another really wonderful opportunity for a, a, a clinical platform and that could be adapted and, and made available to a lot of individual diseases. And we, we're working on ways to try to make that more accessible to others uh, as well in a process somewhat similar to the, the PAVE GT. So I think I'll just stop there and thank all of my colleagues who I've worked with uh, in this effort, and I guess we'll be happy to take questions. But I'll just leave you with this last thought. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just start with the one question we got on the app, so I don't forget. Um, and it was for you, Deborah. Will you tell us more about what happens when you collect blood samples at? A family conference, how many donations do you need to justify coming out to a conference? Um, you know, it, it depends on the disease and how rare and how often or not often they meet. I go, I go for about 15 or 20, I'm willing to, to send somebody. And actually, since we have this exper experiment with Champ One down in Florida, we can organize something remotely as well. So we can, but I will go for 15 or 20. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was curious if you have chosen the four diseases for your pilot program. I would assume that you probably have. And um, if you have not, how do you get considered for that? And how would you could be considered for future yeah. programs like that? We, we, we've, we've pretty much gotten they're going to be diseases that are under study at the NIH Clinical Center. And we've pretty much worked out which ones, but we've not quite got it worked out, so I can't talk about them. But. We thought it was important to, we really wanted to do this at the NIH Clinical Center to utilize the, um, you know, the, all the facilities there and also the fact that the investigators are NIH employees that makes some of this, the whole process uh, faster and more efficient. Why, Peter, why four? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to tell you that was, that was part of a, a deep calculation, but it was kind of a matter of, of what seemed like a reasonable number to do at once, and also how many diseases that we were considering would be appropriate for this pilot.
Hi, Eric Hartman with the Croyd Aremia Research Foundation. This has been a great panel. I just wanted to talk real quick again. It was already mentioned about Coriel. And for many, uh, many people that I've talked to here, they were kind of stunned that within the 20 years that we've been around, uh, that we have been able to position ourselves to actually have two different gene therapy trials underway and uh, a third about to begin. And part of that was we didn't have a really good animal model, but what we realized is we needed to supply the building blocks and have them ready, as was once put by one of our guys, Randy Wheelock, we needed to give them the nails and the hammer uh, to be able to do the research. And what we did was we created uh, our own IPSC lines, which can take months to fully get characterized and quality control. And what we were able to do with Coriel is to have our, uh, our fibroblasts and our IPSCs on file and ready. And then as research became available, we were able to then uh, get that research going immediately and not having that six to, to nine months delay in trying to get those, those needed materials for in vitro efficacy tests within uh, the lab. So for those people that are, are small, rare diseases that are trying to figure out if you're just starting out, one of the things really to consider is trying to build a bio base, uh, uh, a bio bank, excuse me, because whether you know where the research is now, if you have those building blocks available, when it does become available, you can jump on it immediately. Okay, I have one on here. Dr. Brooks, will you share your PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. <laughs> how, oh, somebody just did one. It came in when I was clicking. How does a patient submit? Did, can that person resend it? I hit the button too fast. Sorry. Thanks. Um, really excellent panel. Thank you. Dr. Brooks, this question's for you. So when our, when our son was diagnosed with a neurohaploid insufficiency, it was a splice site variation, and we were on the phone with Dr. Yu uh, a year and a half ago before the whole Mela thing was public. Mm -hmm. We have a number of patients in our community with a splice site variant. And I will never forget that conversation. A, it's fun to talk to Dr. Yu, but B, he said, the trouble with your kid is he's not dying, <laughs> which was a very strange thing to hear. But he said, the FDA will never approve putting this into a patient who's not terminal this early in the game. And since then, Miller's thing's come out and you know, time has passed. And, so the, and, I'm, and I'm asking this question because I think it's generally applicable. It's, it's, all this gene therapy is super exciting. But for those of us who have kids who have neurohaploid deficiencies with, if, excuse me, with a full array of afflictions, right? And the kids who have splice site variants, now that we're a year and a half in, is, is Tim's guidance perhaps outdated, or do you think that's still applicable that we would have a much more rigorous safety and efficacy thing to go through if we were thinking about an, an ASO delivering um, a first splice site variant in the brain? My, my understanding is that from the information that's been made public, that the patient with AT is not, not as far certainly not as far along as Mila was. So I do think things might be different now. But just want to be very clear that I don't, I don't work for the FDA and I would not want to make any statements, but I think, I think things might be different now. Okay, I found the question. How does a patient submit their sample to a biobank? That's for me? I guess. I would guess so. <laughs> um, you can contact uh, anybody at the Coriel Institute or the NIGMS at coriel.org, and we send a box, a kit, for the collection of samples after we have discussed and make sure that uh, it's applicable and that we are going to go forward with that uh, submission. And we just uh, ship out a box. You get your samples collected and send them back to us all prepaid by us. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? OK. Oh, wait. OK, 
Kevin, sorry, they keep coming in I, <laughs> from the time I walked to the back. Kevin, loved your book. Is the video documentary complete? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we have a documentary that we showed here two years ago um, about our trip to Europe, and it is currently on the Amazon video um, for purchase or rental. Um, and we are working on, we just uh, went to China about a year ago, and there is a series uh, about that on YouTube, and that will eventually be made, compiled into a documentary. But for now, it's on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. I got another one. I'm, what is the advantage of developing IPSCs at an institute like Coriel versus other stem cell institute, institutes in the US like Harvard's Stem Cell Institute? But I like to say that ours have one of the best qualities <laughs> uh, around. They are, we are extremely uh, picky with our, with our uh, stem cells. We really are. Um, the only difference that I could say right now is that if you are going through the NGMS repository, you might get put in the list and do it free of charge. They are expensive. They, they are in the thousands of dollars. Um, so it, there's a possibility that, that you make it to that year's list for free. Okay, anyone else want to put something through on the app? <laughs> Anybody else in the room? We still have a little time, so, okay. All right. Thank you, Kevin, Luke, Deborah, and PJ for sharing. Oh, did I have somebody? I, I was just saying, oh. there's gotta be something we can talk about. 15 minutes Yeah, 15 minutes. I want to see, I, I want to pictures. Luke, do you know how to juggle? I don't know how to juggle. Okay. I, no, <laughs> but, um, I want to see pictures, actually, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have so many questions. Maybe, I, can I ask one? Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like there's um, a way, and maybe PJ can speak to it, there's a way to, um, just like you were talking about the mTOR apathies, that mm -hmm. there's a way to find, I'll use our disease as an example. We're starting to find other kinesins. So KIF1A uh, is, a, is a molecular motor protein, it's a kinesin, and there's a whole family of kinesins. And so, one of the things that I think we kind of lucked into was making our website KIF something, something, something. And so we've just opened our natural history study to KIF5, or sorry, KIF1B and KIF1C because families reached out to us and said, you know, hey, I don't have a community or we don't know what's going on. Is there any research? And, and so I'm wondering if you could give us, a, give maybe speak to some guidance about how to find similarities that aren't, are, that go beyond the challenges that our kids face day to day, like our kids all have seizures or something, there are multiple diseases that have seizures, but are there, um, how do you look for diseases that have a biological um, through line to group together, and how can we do that as a community? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, <laughs> there you go, Luke. Um, I think the, the, the short answer is probably if you've got and I think most, most groups do, you have you know, scientific advisory boards and you've got some disease experts, they would be the ones who would be able to, to get at that because sometimes it isn't as obvious, you know, that the most obvious thing is to think that, you know, if it, we'll do all the seizure disorders together. And, and there may, it may make perfect sense to do that. There may well be, you know, obviously treatments for seizures makes a whole lot of sense. But to get at the, some of these underlying cause issues, that will take some digging into the scientific literature. And uh, it's probably best to do that with scientific advisory board or clinicians. But um, certainly patient advocates could do as well. I mean, there's no, if, if it was me and somebody came with a new disease, I would, the first thing I would do is go to PubMed. And I would try to just go to the literature and see what I can understand about this and, and see if it falls into any of these signaling pathways. And even better, is it one where there's ongoing drug development? Yeah. Because then you're not talking about trying to develop a, a clinical trial for this one very rare disease. So I would, I, yeah, I almost kind of reflexively do this when I hear about a disease. What, what pathways can I lump it into? Um, and c can we... Is there a way to utilize existing bio samples to find that? Like, can you guys do it for us, basically? I mean, can, is there a way to, to, not to do it for us, but to, 
beyond um, picking the brains of our scientific advisory board and, and you know, Reed, is there, is there a biological way to do it with samples? I don't do research anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think this is something that you have to leave the scientists, but I just wanted to retake that your, your thought on, on your website and the communities is, in my experience, when the families get together with diseases that are similar, even if they're not identical, they are, have so much more power. And you see it with your CMD. I mean, sometimes they cannot be more different from each other and they have an incredible power by being together in yeah. their conferences and the science that they do and the power that they have with us in their registry. So I definitely, uh, I, I, the idea of leaving a website for other uh, diseases to come through. Um, for how do, you this, how do you find out how to mix them? I guess I think the research is the only thing that you can do, I think. If, yeah, but okay. I, think, I think having access, the fact that these samples exist means that somebody maybe somebody you don't even know mm -hmm. who has this idea, they can get these samples and they can test it out in their lab. Yeah, you don't need to get the people, you just have do, to get the cell lines. Do you think that um, if there are uh, diseases that have a broader, the benefit of going back and resequencing things that have already existed because we're identifying and finding new genes, how beneficial is that for us, right? I think it's the way to go. Yeah. Like yeah. we, we oh, just, absolutely. somebody just sequenced, um, uh, a study with Rett syndrome, and mm. we found KIF-18 hits. So it was like, how how much effort should we put into going back to science that's already been done to reevaluate it? I think Rett syndrome is a perfect example of that. How many diseases do we know that people thought they were with Rett, and now they have their own bio, their own rights because something else, right? And uh, you know, it all, it all went down to sequence back and. And the sequencing has been going again. I mean, the NHGRI is just now sequencing all of their samples already. Everything that was already sequenced that they thought they were deeply sequenced, they're actually going back and resequence them all uh, because they understand that technology has gone far. So I would definitely go back to that. Is NIH doing it? The NHGRI is doing that now. Yeah. So uh, one thing I'd say that's is a, that's that the human vari variation. I think that not only has the technology for DNA sequencing become much faster and much better. But perhaps almost more importantly, the, the ability to interpret some of that. Mm -hmm. Because some, some mutations, you see it and you say, oh yeah, okay, that's obviously a disease-causing mutation. Other ones, it, it, it's really not so obvious. And sometimes these analyses and identifications of key disease-causing mutations are, are done by algorithms. And as time goes on, those algorithms get better. So I would, yeah, I think... That's the way. It's definitely I, something to consider. How does it? I, oh, I got a couple more. Do, do you want to keep going? Or you? Well, I, I wonder how maybe somebody, maybe a foundation member out here could tell me how does a foundation go about kind of asking somebody answer, to right? resequence and who do we ask? She has the answer. <laughs> um, we've had a similar experience with our disorder. We have um, discovered that. There, um, we've identified several patients, for example, in the CP community, in the Rett syndrome community. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Some individuals had clinical diagnoses of Rett's because their testing actually didn't come back with the two um, genes that are associated with Rett. However, the symptoms, except for the degenerative part of it, essentially are very similar to our disorder. So um, what we've been doing is um, we've been talking to leaders in those communities um, and the autism community as well because that's kind of that's a phenotype mm -hmm. of our disorder. So several um, of our patients have been diagnosed with autism as well. So we've been talking to leadership in those communities and, and those foundations to help us um, identify more of our tribe that may really, may think at this point they're part of their tribe. It's a very fine line to walk though because um, they're very protective of their communities and um, rightly so. And it's also difficult we found when a patient um, does get the new diagnosis, they've identified so much for so long with this other syndrome. Yeah. It's, it's been a little bit difficult. We've been successful, you know, but, but it is a very sensitive line to walk. Um, and then I had one question also um, regarding um, the grouping of similar disorders. Um, our disorder doesn't actually have a name yet. It wasn't identifiable until 2016. Right now it's just referred to by the gene, HNRMPH2. 
there are other HNRPs um, that we could group together, but I think there's been a reluctance thus far um, because there's a feeling that the, the treatments and all, and, and all that would be different. Um, how can we address, because increasing our numbers is critical, obviously. Uh, we only have 78 worldwide. So right now at this juncture, our best option is to find someone to group with, but what is your feeling? How does that complicate or um, make the, the research or seeking out researchers more complex? Does it, or is it ben beneficial all around? Uh, I'm trying to think of the, there's a, I think gener generally collaboration and working together, I think should be beneficial. I do know that the reality though in some cases is that you know sometimes groups don't get along and, and it, it, it makes things more complicated. I, I think we've all seen that. It's, it's perhaps understandable but I think in general working with other groups or at least to pursue whether there is enough of an overlap that there's a potential therapeutic benefit that could come from all of these diseases at least seems worth exploring. I, I don't know, without knowing more, I don't, but. We have added one of the groups to our natural history study, which I think will give us more of that information as to whether or not we stay together. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it later. Good, go. Got four more. Yes. Oh, go. Oh, <laughs> They're wow. just blowing in now. <laughs> Good job, Luke. Um, if thanks, you've been told you're the only spoken. one with this. Innovation. If you have been told you are the only one with this genetic mutation, is it fair to think that this probably isn't true? And if so, what is the best first step to identify a community? I, go ahead. Does, uh, you have an experience you, in that. Go, go yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we, this happened to us, and it, it was we go to the companies who are responsible for sequencing those genomes. Mm -hmm. You go to the go to the go to the CLIA certified labs and ask them to put your website as a resource. I don't know. I I, I wish I have it. If anyone wants to look at it, I can show you our and you all probably have them. The genetic reports that come back when you get that horrific diagnosis is there's a space that says resources and it's usually 15 year old literature that says our kids are going to die and there's nothing to do about it, right? But if we can go to these companies and say this is the this is the resource. These are the people who are driving innovation, and these are the people who are, are connecting everybody. Then there's going to be an immediate answer to that question. There's going to be an immediate, this is who I go to, this is how I do it, and oh my god, there are not just one of us. There are more, and we have a, a club we belong to. Yeah. Yeah, there, are, there are many resources online yeah. um, of sequencing platforms where you can compare your your diagnosis to other people, but definitely let's start one of the sequencing companies that usually are part of that. Yeah. yeah. We could get, you know, one of the things we did was, and it, it needs work, a lot of work, I think, mm -hmm. is ClinVar. I was gonna say ClinVar. ClinVar, is we need to have a uniform lexicon of phenotype mm -hmm. rather than kind of getting confused about what to look for and what gene. So I think maybe we could come together and, and maybe work with the folks who are in charge of ClinVar and say, these are some of our needs. Maybe we mm -hmm. could work together with them because that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Could I just add a little bit to that? I think Luke mentioned the, the genetic diagnosis, the genetic information that comes back. And, and the first thing people often understand we look at is, you know, this is the disease I have. And they go to Google it. What they often don't look at is the two, if it's a recessive disease, the two mutations. Because it's written in some sort of scientific language they don't understand. But that, that information could be valuable in some of these other platforms. I think that the situation with the abnormal splicing um, is an example of that. So sometimes that information is quite valuable. If it's, if it's not clear or you don't know how to interpret it, talk to your scientific advisory board or the company, that whoever gave the information, because there can be some value in there. I, and then just before I get too carried away with this, we're talking a lot about abnormal splicing and, and the use of oligonucleotides. There are certainly that's going to affect multiple diseases, but just so people don't get too carried away, there's a lot of different kind of splicing mutations, and not all splicing mutations will be, will be applicable to that therapeutic approach. So there's, there's a, just want to make that clear. Okay, thank you. We used up the 15 minutes. 
What? There's got to be one more question. Two minutes on there. My watch says 345. We can do this. Okay, keep going. Okay. Biobanking, where do we find info on privacy and ownership of samples collected? Um, I, it's, you can look it on our website, NGMS, uh, the Coriel or, the org. but in, in the case of the NGMS, uh, the samples belong to the NIH. When you, once you donate your samples to the NIGMS repository, they will be a property of the NIH. Okay. Kevin, can you share some learnings and perhaps some innovations that came out of your trip? In one minute and 25 you take all seconds. You got the rest of the time. This is a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we want to hear this. Uh, well, and if I can go back to the one about uh, being the one person with a, you know. The, yeah, that You're the one. only one with genetic mutation. Is there it fair is. to think yeah. that this um, probably isn't true? Mm -hmm. uh, just real quick, I think. Uh, oh, one minute and four seconds. Uh, <laughs> oh, the stress. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, my sister um, is a couple years older than me, and we were, uh, when I came along, by then we were both diagnosed with SMA uh, type 2, which there weren't even really types at the time, so uh, we figured that, that out since. But um, yeah, so we, we grew up kind of being the only people with SMA around us, and, uh, and we, it's interesting because we, we did find other families like with Duchenne and, and things like that uh, to connect with. And so uh, that question, I, I would be curious whoever asked it, if, um, if they're asking in, in context of research, uh, mm. what you guys are talking about makes perfect sense. And I'm so glad you had the answer because I don't. Uh -huh. but, um, but I would wonder too if there's a, a question there as far as um, having a community to identify with. And, um, and so whoever that is, um, I, I hope that you do have those people um, in your life. Uh, it, may, uh, it may be someone that doesn't have the exact thing that you do, but um, we all, none of us are perfect. We all have some sort of uh, deficiency in our lives that um, allows us to identify with one another. And so, um, yeah, my hope is that uh, you can find people around you uh, to connect with in some regard related to, to what you have. As far as our innovations, uh, we, we figured out a lot of things, but we're 39 seconds after the clock, so. I know, I know, I just got in trouble. What's that? I just got in trouble. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I got sorry, the, I got that's the. my bad. <laughs> I'll take the blame, but we can talk about that another time. So. Thanks, guys. Thank you.